Since then, he's been at IBM Haifa, University of Reykjavik, and currently in the Mass CS department at Emory. And he'll talk to us about caches and distributed systems. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me fine? Yep. You're good. Okay, great. So I don't know if anybody here has met anybody from Iceland. Let's see if this can really work here. Anybody met anybody from Iceland? Any takers? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. it's on here. Great. Okay. So this is like an obnoxious reputation that. No matter the circumstances, we were like obnoxious to try to promote our home country, so pictures of <laughs> But I'm totally not going to do that, right? Okay, instead, I'm just going to talk about my research. So my research has kind of three different hats. So the main hat that I wear is that kind of a systems built, built system, network system. Um, I also uh, fiddle around with security. So in particular, I'm a co-inventor of something called Formic String Exploits, for those of you who know of uh, security stuff. And I have a security company that I co-founded. Uh, and also do some data science, so like application-driven machine learning, things like that. So today I want to talk to you about a main thing that I've been doing, which is the systems aspect here. So in particular, I've been very interested in a question called data replication. So this is the question of how do you get the same data to multiple people or computers or wherever at the same time? It's a very fundamental question in distributed systems, I think. Now this question gets really interesting when you start to add any twist to it. So in particular, some of the things that I've been working on are things like consistency. So suppose you go to that wild party and that, first, you want to post pictures of them on Facebook. So first you like you remove your mom from like the list of people who can see your pictures, and then you upload all those juicy photos and so forth. So consistency is this idea that your mom will not be able to see your pictures instead of the uh, request of the permissions being changed arriving in a different order at the side. So that's a... Um, a very interesting problem in computer science, particularly in computer systems that uh, a lot of people are working on. I've also been looking on um, some security properties of this kind of data replication, in particular aggregation of data. So suppose you want to get data from multiple sources and want to make sure that the thing has high integrity and high confidentiality. How do you do that? How do you have tamper-proof sensors and stuff like that? Something that really compels me is scalability. Like how do you make things scale? How do you get data to lots and lots and lots of different places? So as soon as you start asking that question, you have to actually add a whole new dimension to the problem. You have to add the dimension of how quickly do you need the data to get there. So if you want to have it extremely quickly, like on the left-hand side of this axis over here, you're in the domain of broadcast or multicast. In fact, you'd like to have the network help you out. You send a packet, and the network says, hey, I know where the packet is going. I'm going to forward it. Uh, and it's going to get there as soon as it's pushed out. So I've done a, a lot of work in trying to make this multicast primitive, which exists everywhere, but is almost never used to try to make it useful. So I've worked on a thing called Dr. Multicast, and I've been working on some live streaming systems with a group in Israel. Now, if you can't make use of the network itself, you're in the domain of what's known as application-level multicast, or overlay, so peer-to-peer -peer systems and things like that. So I've been working on a variety of different problems in that area as well. And then, if you're in the domain where you don't really need to get the data immediately out to the places where they're supposed to go, you're in what I call the domain of caching. So this is what I'm going to focus on today. What is caching, right? So most of you have a very solid computer science background, and so you all kind of know what it is. But let's just have a, a quick refresher. So on a single computer, you have the property that you have um, all your programs tend to write some sort of memory. A memory is, tends to be the bottleneck. And then you have this kind of precious memory that's really fast, but it's so expensive, and it's, like, it's contained in a particular unit that it's usually very small. So you try to make very good use of it. And this happens not just in terms of being there being fast and slow memory, you actually have a whole hierarchy. You have, the, um, you have your CPU registers being really, really fast, and with only about a handful of them. So data you can store in the registers, you tend to shove into something known as level one, level two, level three caches, where when you try to update something, it takes about half nanoseconds, level three takes about seven nanoseconds. And then if you can't fit it in your several megabyte big uh, L3 cache, you're into main memory. 
And main memory actually takes 100 nanoseconds to access. And there you have maybe several gigabytes of, of uh, storage to play around with. And when it doesn't fit in RAM, you have to go to disk, right? And just like spinning up your disk, it's like a glorified CD player, right? Um, if spinning up your disk takes 10 million nanoseconds just to get it to the right location, then you start reading the data, right? So there's a whole hierarchy here uh, that we have to uh, be mindful of. It really goes uh, from the faster memory on the top to the big and cheap memory here on the bottom, right? So this is the memory hierarchy and the notion of caching. This is the traditional view of caching, okay? So what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a more distributed variant of this. So suppose we take the same idea and try to apply it for the web. So how do these big websites work? Well, back in 2000, they kind of worked as follows. There's a whole bunch of people that want to like open up their Facebook. And Facebook is a small little thing on the internet. And they just send requests to web servers. And those web servers, in turn, are going to send queries over to a database tier. There's a whole bunch of databases that store how many friends David has, or how many parties are happening in University of Arizona tonight, or whatever, right? And you just get the, get the response back. And databases, kind of by their design, they're going to go onto disk, a very well-structured disk, and try to find the answer. And as we just learned, like, this actually take a very long time to find the answer. So as this scales up, what happens, right? Um, so very popular websites have kind of moved to an alternate design, and this is in the past maybe 15 years or so, where instead of going directly and having the web servers talk to the database, they're going to talk to what's called the memcast tier, or cache tier. So now what's going to happen is that if I'm looking at, for instance, how many, uh, I'm, I'm rendering the Facebook front page. I'm looking up how many friends David has, I may first ask the task here, uh, this cast here over here, hey, have we already computed this? Do we already know how many friends he has? And the cast here may, in many cases, just return the result, be like, yeah, we just did that. And I have it here in my RAM, and I just looked it up. So this is a very fast response. Um, so we only have to touch RAM here, and uh, the bottleneck in this particular case here is just the network. So between machines and a data center, you're looking at maybe 500,000 nanoseconds. 500 uh, microseconds. And for the results that you don't have in your cache, you then, and there are much fewer of them, talk to the database and get the response. And there, of course, the database always knows the full response. This is kind of the, the distributed caching ledger. And feel free to shout out questions if you have them. Okay? So, let me do a little comparison here of this old one to the new world here. It's called the cache, clash, cache. <laughs> cache, class, clash. Something like that. So, here on the right, I have this kind of new distributed uh, caching world. And here on the left, I have kind of the old old world of caching, which is very relevant, very important, but it's something that we've been studying for 70 years, and we have a very good understanding of how it works. But I argue that a lot of the assumptions that we're making here on the left no longer hold. So here on the right, we have maybe 15 years of experience dealing with the servers. We never did any thorough academic study of how these caches should be created, how they should be structured, what we should store in them, or anything like that. What, has, what is the fundamental difference here is that this cache that I've described here is predominantly driven by hardware. So you're kind of limited by the size of the die that you have here, or you're limited by things that need to happen at nanosecond latencies. You don't have time to do any type of thinking. You just have to like get the answer right out there. We're seeing the right, you're actually in software, you're dealing with something that's bottlenecked by network where you have 500 uh, microseconds to deal with things. You have, you have time for a lot of computation, actually, even like adding a few percent to a, re uh, to a request, you can do a lookup in, uh, in several tables and see what you can do better in terms of what you return from a cache. So you can afford to think here. If you miss in a memory hierarchy over here, suppose something is not in RAM and you have to go on disk, you kind of know how long that's going to take. It's going to be on disk, it's going to take about 10 million nanoseconds. Whereas here on the right, it could be that the, the database query that we missed on might be looking up number of friends, which is easy, but it could be like a triple join in some database. It could be really expensive. So there's actually variable miss penalties, all sorts of changes like that. And most fundamentally, things that we're looking at here on the left are driven by programs. They're driven by loops and programs and saying like, oh, is this variable going to be accessed again? Or is this a table or not? It's something that's kind of dictated by compilers and something that's kind of not really driven by humans, whereas things here on the right are fundamentally driven by aggregate crops. That's a very different set of workloads, and that means that there are a different set of opportunities to delve from. So I think this is a hugely exciting research area. There's so much that has been fundamentally been toppled in terms of what we assume 
in this casting literature that it's pretty much like a, a blank slate, tabula rasa. So um, from this, um, I just got an NSF career grant to work on something called the SmartCast project. And uh, some of the questions that I'm asking in this project are things like, how much cache do you need? How many cache servers do you need? How big should your memcast tier really be? I went to Facebook and I asked them just how many servers do you guys need? And they were like, yeah, we never thought about that. We just bought a whole bunch, right? So that's one of the questions I'm going to be talking about today. Or what data should you really keep in it? Do you store everything? Do you keep the most recently used and most frequently used? Do you prefetch things? Nobody's thought about it. Um, how do you know that this is the thing you should be doing? How do you mechanically um, evaluate whatever approaches that you come up with? Do you just try them out and hope they work? So the Smart Cash project has several ambitions, and some of the things that we're trying to address are things like we want to make it cost conscious, we want to make it provident, like smart about how it makes decisions, and we want to make it efficient. So when I say cost conscious, I mean that this system that we're trying to create here, it's like an umbrella term for several systems, it should be able to account for different eviction impact. So if something is going to be a triple join in the database, maybe that's an element that should be retained in the cache, where something like a simple join of how many friends you have can be kept. Um, we want to be able to balance load to avoid the hotspots. This is a project that actually had a hotspot fit with Facebook because all their caches had uh, Put it this way, when Justin Bieber posted a comment, a machine of Facebook would melt. So we we're trying to make that not happen, right? So trying to balance the load in the cache, okay? Um, we're trying to be smart, so we're trying to exploit some features about the content. So caches traditionally are just this anonymous blob, so I just tell you, here's a key and here's some value, and you're just this cache, and you're just like, oh, yes, master. You put it in some location, and then you just shove it back. But you never use the information that's been given to you. So if you have this information about, hey, I'm actually this part of the program and I'm asking you to store this stuff, then I as a caching would be like, well, whenever you in this part of the program ask me to store stuff, you never ask about it again. I'm going to ask about it and I'm just going like, to throw it away, right? So I can do all sorts of smart decisions simply by knowing a little bit of the context of where it came from. Um, we can try to predict even what's going to be in the cache at all. So this is a very interesting project that I, uh, we're doing currently, which is trying to figure out whenever you look at picture number 17 in a photo album, I'm, I keep using Facebook in a sample, I do a lot of work with them. When you look at picture number 17 in a photo album, chances are you're going to look at picture number 18. But that's like a higher level concept. The cache doesn't know anything about this. The cache is just like nobody has ever requested picture number 18. I'm just going to wait for you to ask for it, and then you're going to scramble when somebody asks for it, try to get it out of the disk, spin up the old disk, it's an old album, get it into like the caching hierarchy, and then finally respond to it. Whereas what Facebook would rather want to do is to be like, maybe I should have picture 18 just lying around just in case. Okay. So being able to predict this thing, and so we want to do this kind of without a particular application in mind, more like a methodology for how you do it. We want to make it efficient. So I'm a project that um, was from the hot storage where we tried to programmatically regenerate data in the cache. Um, and we can talk more about that. And finally, the one I want to talk about today is how do we adapt cache size based on how things are doing, based on uh, how, how the cache is making use of um, the workload and so forth. So in particular, out of all these questions that we're exploring here, today we're going to be looking at these two. How much cache do you need? And how do you know? Okay? So, do you have, you have a question? Or, no, okay. So let's go back to this uh, figure that I had here. So here are the popular websites, right? So we have a whole bunch of queries going to the MMK servers, and here's a database responding. It's fine, right? So what if I ask a question, what would happen if you had more cache servers? Okay? What if I added two servers? What would happen? Well, what could happen is that you might be able to re return more results from the cache here. It might be that you simply had to evict some of the stuff that you um, could have kept if you had more cache servers, and thus you would have faster response times, and you would even shield some of the load of your databases. Could happen, yes? What about security issues in what regard? This is all within like one domain. Okay. 
the thing is that you're kind of within the perimeter. So the question is about, uh, I'm repeating for them, sorry. So the question is about security. What about security here? What if you add more service? Do you have to worry about security issues? You're within like one domain. So you've already kind of passed the, the outer perimeter of the security. And so adding service doesn't really change that. Now there are interesting questions about cache. And the particular question that you might want to ask is, what happens if you access something and you get the answer right away? Chances are somebody else asked about it. That's a very interesting cache question that's open right now. It's something that people are trying to work on and fix. Is what about timing attacks against caches? That's a very interesting one. I haven't looked at that at all. Um, anyway, so I'm saying here, if you have more cache servers, um, you might get something uh, in return. You might actually get better response time, and you may make use of them. But also, nothing might happen. In fact, you added more servers, and you get the same performance which would be an utter waste of money, right? So uh, too many cache servers might be a waste of resources. So that's one end of like a spectrum. Conversely, if I ask, hey, you have these cache servers, you bought them, they're really expensive, they're actually hundreds of thousands of them running in your operating, in your data center. If I shut down a few of them, what will happen? Well, what might happen is nothing. Might be that these servers weren't really needed. They aren't really contributing to better performance. What might also happen is that you might get fewer results now back from the cache server because you're unable to keep kind of the working set in memory, which means that you get more requests to the database. And what happens then, right? You guys use databases, right? Yes, yes, yes. PowerPoint happens, right? Um, <laughs> so pretty much like what would happen is that your database tier might actually melt. In fact, for a while, if you turned off all the cache servers at Facebook, Facebook would never come back up. This was a true statement for a very long time. It made them extremely uncomfortable. It's better now. But it was the case that as soon as they would uh, try to fill in the caches, all the databases that were being touched would just melt. Like it was a really bad time for them. They were really worried about this. So now they've, they've, they've done some cool stuff. But this is actually important. And this happens sometimes when smaller startups are, are adding their cache tiers and then they accidentally flush all the caches and you know, things just go really bad. Anyway, so too few cache servers here can overload the database, okay? So, how do we optimize these two extremes here? How do we optimize cache resources? And so the idea that I want to bring to you, and this is something that I want you to walk away from this talk, something that maybe you haven't seen before and you'd like to apply. It's a little hammer for you guys to use in, I don't know, cocktail parties or papers or whatever. It's, uh, the idea is about hit rate curves. So right now, if we think about the main thing, if I'm saying adding servers or removing servers, the main parameter here is this cache size, the aggregate number of gigabytes that I'm spending on caching data, okay? That's the main parameter. So I can have a, a chart like this that says, hey, here's my cache size here on the x-axis. And what we currently know, if we're operators at one of these big sites and we want to know how we're doing, what we tend to measure is our hit rate, the fraction of requests that actually were served from the cache instead of having to go to a slower storage. And this is what we know right now. We just know like, well, we currently have this many servers and this is our hit rate. That doesn't tell us anything about what happened. What I want to do is like, hey, I want my cache servers to actually return the whole graph, telling you exactly what would have happened if you had had more space or less space than you currently have. So this curve here just says like, hey, if you have this much, uh, if you have space for a thousand items or whatever, your hit rate would be about 15%. And you can just do the calculations about how much money would you save if you went in this direction, like if you half the size of your cache tier, versus how much more do you have to spend on your database tiers, how much more latency is now being incurred by the different clients and so forth. So you can do calculations if you have this curve. So the question is, can we generate this? And so when we try to do that, you're gonna to need to worry about a number of different things. And this is where we put our systems hat on, is that we don't just like generate a curve. We have to do it carefully. We have to be efficient about it. So we want to make sure that, because these are critical services, we want to be time efficient. We want, don't want it to be the case that if I'm asking for something in a, in a service, I'm now taking like six seconds to do additional calculations and then getting the answer because, simply because I'm trying to optimize cast resources. It has to be really time efficient. It also has to be space efficient because by definition, what we're doing is trying to say, if you had 10% more cache servers, you could do something. If we spend 50% more cache space on trying to achieve this number, that's completely defeats the point. Um, we want it to be accurate. We want it to be the case that we're not just putting like some like, like our, our curve shouldn't just be like a smiley face, that, like looks nothing like the real curve. Uh, we want it to be pretty high fidelity with the actual real curve. And ideally, we'd like to prove something here. So this is something that systems people tend to want to do, is that you have 
something that we're going to do, we're going to keep it as simple as possible, but ideally you'd like the core part of it to be something that's kind of theoretically sound. So you put your like theory hat on a little bit. And then of course you want it to be usable. Simple interface, you want it to be modular. So yeah. Are you going to run this, that the graph that you have, are you generating that every so often? I'm, uh, yes, very, exactly. Very frequently. So I'm generating that as often as you'd like. So it's on request. So there's a, there's going to be, I'm, I'm showing you the API in just a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the goal here is the goal to turn off caches if you don't need them, or are you going to sell them? The goal here is just to monitor how you're doing with the different caches, right? So here, um, you can do whatever this is information that you like. You could, for instance, suppose you're leasing resources from the cloud, right? You're saying, hey, I want to have this many cache servers. It means that I'm paying for the number of servers that I have. have up. If I have this curve, I could just tell Amazon or whoever is leasing my resources, give me fewer servers, like power down two of my 10 cache servers, simply because I've calculated that I don't really need them. Or, oh no, things are really bad, I need two more. And in fact, I'll generate a lot more hits and I'll reduce latencies and burden on my databases if I add two more servers. That's the level of things that we want to be working on. Does that answer your question? Other questions before we proceed? Yes, go ahead. Ah, very good question. So there's two, two embedded questions in what you're asking. So the question is, um, can you repeat the same curve? Um, so the two things that, that, that uh, I'd like to say about that is, first of all, it depends on how frequently your workload changes. And so what we've observed is that workloads are changing in the cloud not too fast, not as fast as you would be generating this curve. So we're expecting that this is something that like an operator in a room would be monitoring and it'd be updated maybe every five minutes or whatever is needed for whatever application there is. And the workloads themselves are shifting at a, at a slower pace than that. And I tend, this tends to be true. The fact that I don't know that for, uh, for sure is actually a reason why after this project we started to try to do a workload study of what actually happens. And so that's something that we're commencing right now. Other questions? Yeah. I'm just going to follow up on that because the spikiness of the traffic is kind of what causes the problems in the first place, right? So you're talking about like tail latencies and stuff like that? Well, and, and the fact that it's sort of unpredictable when Justin, Justin Bieber is going to post in some sense, right? Like your workload is going to change precisely in the moment that you need to know the best. So we created a little system precisely for these types of peaks, right? So um, we created a system that um, kind of measures traffic that is coming in and it tries to uh, locate signatures that indicate that they're actually going to be popular. So we use some stuff from like the KDD community of seismic detectors. And as soon as you see that something is going to be extremely popular, you replicate that to multiple servers. So that's the kind of, that's the way to deal with those types of com like hotspots that are going to come in, right? Uh, and we're doing that currently, actually, I think Facebook is putting into production for video right now. So like trying to detect popular videos before it happens. Um, okay, so let's move on here. So. Here's pretty much the system that we want to create here. We have a cache server, and um, uh, it's multi-threaded, and this is important here. And uh, the interface that it has is that you get some requests coming in, so like a get or a set, um, and we have a replacement algorithm that takes these elements here. And what we want to do is that we want to have something that works here in parallel called Memer, so good dirt. And whenever there's a hit in the replacement algorithm or a miss or a set or something, we want to know about it. So we get this, uh, this information, we use it to estimate the current hit rate curve, so HRC here. Um, we have ghost list that I'll tell you about in a little bit in aging policy. And then periodically, or on request, there's an export HRC routine here that generates these figures. And we can do so as often as you like. So that's kind of the architecture we want to build here. So what I want to focus on really is what's happening over here. Okay? So let me bring out some definitions here. So here's something about caching that would be interesting to know. There's this thing called the inclusion property, which is kind of cool. So it means that for some cache replacement algorithms, the content of a smaller cache are going to be included in, the, um, uh, in a bigger cache with the same policy, given the same input. Now let me explain what that means, okay? So here's like an LRU list. This is like a list here, head of the list, okay? So it means that if the same LRU that is of size A2 sees a particular input sequence, then uh, a four size LRU list over here, then the two elements are going to be LRU uh, at any time over here are going to be contained in what's going to be in the big So if you follow this property, it's called, an, the, uh, it's called an inclusion property, and you get a stack algorithm if this is fulfilled. Okay? So examples of um, algorithms that fulfill this are like LRU, which is one of the most popular cache replacement algorithms, least recently used, least frequently used, and the optimal. So you have questions? Okay. Um, and then another definition I want to bring here is stack distance or reuse distance. 
So it's the number of distinct accesses between the current and last reference to item. So suppose I'm a cache and I'm getting in a request. My requests are request A, B, A, C, D, B, A, okay? Now let's look at this definition and figure out what the stack distances are. What's the stack distance of the first time that I ever see an item? I can't hear anyone, sorry. Anyone? I haven't seen it before, it has to be infinite, right? Okay, and same for B, right? We know I've seen B before. What about A here? I've seen one distinct item since I last saw A. So it's one, okay? What about C? Infinite, B. I've seen two things since I last saw B, A and C, okay? What about B now? Uh, zero, I haven't seen anything since I last saw B. What about A here? Ah, it's two because I've seen two distinct things since the last one. So make sense? This is reuse distance. This is an extremely useful metric for anything cache related. So whenever you have a system or whatever you're making and you have a cache in it, think about this metric. This will tell you a lot. This is actually one of the kind of revolutions that happened in the whole caching literature in the past decade or so. Okay? So here's a theory that makes it concrete why I'm even bringing you this definition. It's that LRU, the least, uh, least recently used cache replacement algorithm, has the following property. You can characterize as follows. An element E is going to be contained in a cache of some size n, if and only if the reuse distance of that item at that time is the most n. If you think about it a little bit, it kind of makes sense. It means that what's known as stack distance, which is pretty much where in the LRU list something is located, is exactly the reuse distance. This makes perfect sense because you only move stuff in LRU when you have seen a new distinct element. Right? All aboard? Okay, so we're going to use this idea here. We're going to create this uh, hitter curves specifically for LRU by using this reuse distances. So now if I show you a graph that used to have cache size on the x-axis, I can now just have reuse distance. I can track those and I'll, I'll be golden. So here's another trick I want to show you. I told you that I could predict what's going to happen to a cache when it, um, when it grows. And so far, I've shown you something that's actually just tracking things that have happened uh, that are less than the current cache size. So what we're going to do is that we're going to extend our LRU list with data list ghost entries. Suppose we can track n entries over here. We're just going to add n more keys. So in other words, <laughs> we're going to pretend that we have an LRU list that has two n elements. But we're not really going to track the values for these sort of things. We just know that we evicted something. We know what happened, and we're just like, well, we're sorry, we don't have it anymore. But we track uh, kind of the reuse distances of these particular accesses. It's called a ghost list. So this gives us a um, this gives us the ability to try to predict things that are going to happen. Okay. So in other words, the right hand side of this graph is going to be ghosts. The rest of it is going to be tracking reuse distances. So how do we do it? Imagine you were trying to solve this problem. We're trying to generate this curve that we're talking about. Generate this curve. You're trying to, try to track these reuse distances. How would you do it? What's the natural reaction of how you do it? So one thing you do is just like every time you have a hit, you determine where in your LOU list you are. Right? How far are you away from the head? It's that simple, right? And then you accumulate, oh, I had a hit here on the seventh element. So let's just illustrate it. Here's your LRU list, which is these particular items over here. And you have this kind of unnormalized PDF where you have like the number of hits here on the Y and the stack distance here on the X. So what's gonna happen is that there's a request here for element E. So we're gonna go like, okay, E is the fifth element from the head. And we're gonna increment here the fifth thing in the array. Great. And then we move E to the front, just like in regular LRU, and we proceed. And now there's a request for item T which is here, and we go and we say, okay, T is the seventh element here in the list, so we increment the seventh thing in our normal SPDF, and move to the front, and we're good to go. Makes perfect sense. Any problems with this approach? That's a linear search. It's linear search sure, in every single time. It's just like we're walking the linked list every time we have a, a cache access. That's ludicrous, right? We're trying to be efficient. So what do we do when linear search is not efficient? We're computer scientists. What do we do? What is our knee-jerk reaction, right? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I hear hashing, binary search. I hear, I hear trees, anyone? 
Like, we take, like, the thing, we take the list here, and it'll, like, blah, turn it into, like, a tree, right? Uh -huh. This is, like, the, the knee-jerk reaction we have when we see this problem. So we're like, well, yay, okay, there's a, an element axis here. We can just, like, traverse the tree here. It's login operations. And everybody's happy, right? Any problems with this? How do you move it? How do you move what? The element? Move yeah, now you have to rebalance the tree on every single try, so you get another login over there. But in particular, we're multi-threaded, right? We have a lot of things that are coming in, multiple threads. So we have massive lock contention on, on this head over here. Actually, an unacceptable lock contention. So that's another thing that we uh, really need to worry about here. So in our approach here, we take a slightly different uh, attack here. And in order to be able to make that attack, we have to make some concessions. In particular, so far, prior work has really been focusing on trying to get exact results for this curve for every single item. And we're going to say, what if we trade off a little bit of the accuracy and try to make gains in efficiency? Let's see how much more efficient we can be if we are slightly more, uh, sorry, slightly less accurate. OK? Let's just see how far we can get. So here's the algorithm that we propose. So the earlier list here, uh, before I hit on item E, looks like this. OK? Here's our earlier list, which actually is these items over here. What I've done is I've taken every single item and put it in a bucket. OK? So I have like B buckets over here. So B is a parameter. Okay, so the invariant that I'm imposing on the system is that within a bucket, I have no idea what order you're in. But the buckets themselves are in order. So I definitely know that the reuse distance of things in this bucket are greater than in this bucket or that bucket. Make sense? So let's say that there's a hit now on item E. Every single item here knows what bucket it's in. Okay, so E is like, oh, I'm in bucket two. Great. Um, so now we're going to try to do what we did before, which is to update this anomalous PDF and say, okay, there was a hit on element number O. We don't, we don't know which one, right? We know that the element is somewhere between one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, but we don't know which order, right? Make sense? So instead of just trying to put it at the exact right location, which we can't do, we're gonna just smear it over and say like, well, that's like one third probable of being in any of these locations. This is a key thing that we do in our approach. It's to say, we don't know where you are in the bucket, but we know you're in the bucket, we're going to assume it's equal problem. Okay? And then we just proceed and we move E here to the front. So in other words, it moves here to the list, it's in the front, and it gets tagged with being in the front bucket so that we maintain our invariant. Okay? Now, this can't be the end of the algorithm. Why? Yeah, I'll overflow. Ah, yes. Everything would just be bucket zero after like few rounds and there'd be no game, right? So what we're going to do periodically is that we're going to perform aging. We're going to shift the buckets around a little bit. And we have two different methods of doing this. So the first one, so here's like E is down the front and everybody has been aged here to the right. And we merge the rightmost buckets over here. And our goal is to try to keep these buckets um, somehow in some order. Actually, it's a little bit more tricky than that. I'll show you in a little bit. The two methods are stacker, which is called stacker for no good reason, and rounder. So stacker, what it's going to do is that it's going to walk the LRU list, it's going to look at the reuse distance, simply by looking at where it is in the list, and it's going to say, hey, are you below the average reuse distance? If so, I'm going to bump you up to a, a higher bucket, so a bucket that's further on the right. I'm trying to balance the buckets a little bit here. A simpler method that we have here is called rounder. We just look at all these buckets and we just say, hey, you are currently in bucket number two, I'm just going to make bucket number two mean something entirely different. I'm not going to shift the frame of reference so that the buckets are labeled from zero, minus one to two. So now you're in the oldest bucket if you're in two, right? So that I can do in constant time. So the first one here is more precise. It's like order B, where B is the number of buckets amortized. And the, uh, the second one here is something that's constant time, since I can just shift the frame of reference. So this happens whenever the first bucket here is full. And by full, I mean it takes more than n over b elements. It has more than its fair share. And now we have this unnormalized hit rate curve. We can just integrate it, and this is our hit rate curve. Voila, right? That's what we want to output. So let me just summarize it a little bit. So we have a ghost list that doubles the number of elements that we track, which means that we can predict what's going to happen for uh, double your cache size. Whenever there's a hit on an item E, we can update the statistics for that bucket. We're going to then move that element to the front, like we would do in regular LRU. And we're going to tag it as belonging to the first bucket. When the first bucket is full, meaning that it has more than n over b elements, we call this aging procedure. And there are two different ones. Um, they're going to be either order b or order 1. 
depending on how accurate you want to be. And the whole thing is kind of dominated by other order B or order log B, depending on how we update PDF statistics. You can use a prefix tree if you want to be very efficient here. And then periodically, or on, on demand, we're going to calculate and export this curve. That's it. Any questions about the approach? Yes, lots of questions. Yeah, I think you reversed. You have a tree over the buckets. Yeah, so we can have a tree here over the buckets, like a little prefix tree. So, yeah, so the things that you don't have to have them, so you can have per thread, you can have your own set of buckets, and then when you do your actual accumulation, you can just consult the values of there. There's no, you never have to wait for anyone. Uh, yeah, another question? Same question, okay. Other questions? Yes, you have a question. Is there like a thread on each machine in your cache buffer? Because your cache buffer has ah, so multiple current, machines. Yeah, ah, okay, so this is a good question. I'm focusing on a single machine right here. What's nice about this problem is it's, it's very parallelizable. So we're imagining that we're in a data center. It has consistent hashing over all its different machines. So each machine is its own cache server. It's, it's pretty much the same kind of workload within logic. Like, I can, we can talk about the differences there. It sees a workload, and this is what it's trying to do on its workload in its multi-threaded memcache implementation. So this is what it tracks. It exports this on one machine. On, on per machine. And then actually, and this is a step that I don't really have time to talk about, but the step is here that you're gonna accumulate these different hit rate curves from different machines and you can add them up. And there's like a formula you can use for that. One of the assumptions that I'm making implicitly here is that all the different uh, nodes in a, uh, in a consistent hashing environment are gonna see the same exact workload, which is kind of true, but not fully true. And we're exploring the details of that currently actually. Um, another thing that we're not doing here, which somebody may have a question for, is that we're not doing any sampling. And if we did sampling, we can actually make this a lot more efficient. That's something we're also working on right now. Um, so let's evaluate this, right? Yes, you have a question. How close? Oh, yeah. So B here, like, as it turns out from evaluation, B is a small constant, like at most 100. N here can be uh, millions of, of items. So at Facebook, we're looking at a single machine having about 120 gigs of RAM. Each item can be very small, maybe 100 bytes or so. So you're looking at something that's in the, in the millions, hundreds of millions of items. So B is tiny. OK, other questions? Yes. Um, when, when you were uh, populating or updating those uh, histograms uh -huh. based on the hits, I was wondering why you had a whole bunch of columns in each of those buckets instead of just having a curve bucket. You know, in this range of the the hit rate curve, we had so many bits. So the variable size buckets, right? The buckets are changing in size, right? So we have like some granularity on this thing here. That granularity is something that's customizable as well. Um, and these statistics are updated per thread, and then you can accumulate them as well to avoid lock contention again. Uh, does that answer your question? I'm not sure I fully. Fully got it. Well, I'm just wondering as you ship the buckets along. Well, I guess yeah, the bucket bucket sizes are changing yes. rapidly. Yes. And that's actually very important, as we'll see just momentarily. Okay. Thank so you. let's look at um, let's look at the accuracy here, right? So um, I'm measuring accuracy here by what I think is pretty standard, which is just the L1 norm, the mean average error when I compare two distributions. So look at how different are the distributions in every single export date. Okay. And I'll just sum up the absolute differences between them. So here's a graph here for rounder, so the kind of less, if it, less accurate but faster of the two variants. And I'm actually starting here at 90%, right? So this is accuracy here on the, on the y, which is defined as 1 minus this error. So here, the different shades of blue actually indicate um, different number of buckets. So as I go from 8 buckets up to 128 buckets, I start to see higher and higher accuracies. And the x-axis here are all the different traces that we ran. So we, all, every tra cast trace that we could find is in here. So these are all the different, uh, this is like a financial workload that IBM collected. There's a web search one from I don't even know where. Uh, there's a whole bunch of workstation ones from Microsoft. There's all the kind of standard traces from the kind of file system literature and casting literature, everything. And we always kind of got the result that we're getting really high accuracies. And in fact, if I move it over to Stacker, it's even better. Like we're looking at something that's very close to 100% accurate. And it doesn't, like if you're an operator and you're looking at this curve, minute differences between like the truth and, and not are gonna be insignificant at the same In fact, this is surprisingly accurate. Remember we conceded uh, the kind of tiny bit of efficiency here, and we wanted to see if we were really sacrificing accuracy, and, and we seem to not be. And this was actually very interesting to us, it was surprising to us. 
So we start to look at it. There must be something underneath the hood here that we need to understand a little bit better. So 98 to 99.8% accuracy. So if you look at the curves themselves, so here are a few curves. Here's rounder on the top, here's stack on the bottom, and here's just actual uh, hit rate curves with a different number of buckets again. What we can see is something that you might see when you're doing kind of like polynomial approximation to a curve, like a Fourier series, something like that. You see that like the curve itself kind of starts to like fit more snugly to these kind of very convoluted Cassegrain curves. This is very interesting that this would happen. So in other words, somehow we're able to hone in on exactly these uh, hard parts of the curve where things shift really rapidly, and as we add more buckets, we simply get a better approximation. There's something very fundamental going on here. So if you let's zoom in here, you can see it really well. It like hones in here on this particular dot. It's very cool, right? So we looked at this like there must be something here. So if we try to put our like theory hat on and try to do something about it, we can say, well, actually, if we go back to how the method works, what it does is that we estimate that you're going to be in this particular range. You're going to have um, the true hit. We put one third here on three different uh, locations. But what would an optimal algorithm really do? So it would be the way to compare the two, right? So the algorithm really is just taking every single request and saying, I'm summing over all the different possible locations. So here's the possible locations, and I've, I've taken my unit mass here, and I've spread it over this particular interval. Whereas an optimal algorithm would just take the right location, it knows the right location, and just puts the unit mass over there. And conveniently, because I'm looking at the L1 norm, I can just compare these two, and the comparison is not going to be temp dependent on the size of the of the buckets themselves. Okay, so you can just like I can show you the proof if you if you like. So if you just do the calculation, you'll see that the mean average error that we can prove from this is going to be two over n times the largest bucket, the largest size of the bucket during uh, the traces. And when we looked at the traces in practice, this is going to be order one over the number of buckets. So think about it this way: if I have 100 buckets, I have about one percent error. That's kind of what I can prove here, 1%, order of 1%. So as I, as I, um, it's like this reciprocal of um, this knob that I have for accuracy. Very cool, right? So performance, that's another thing we have to, have to do. We're, that's one of the things we try to promise here up front, was that things perform really well. So we ran, uh, we modified Memcast to add this memo component to it and ran on the standard YCSP workload. Um, accuracy on that workload was very good. Here's the error of. Uh, 0.3% with 128 buckets. And uh, we took 10 nodes here in a, in a cluster. We have uh, like six uh, 2.4 gigas machines with 20, no, with 48 gigs of RAM. And we just bombarded this one machine over here that was running a memcache server, just to kind of keep a high throughput. I wanted to see what impact are we seeing on throughput here. So here, throughput here on the y-axis, we're looking at the CASAs here, um, exponentially increasing on the x. And what we'll see is that the regular Memcast, which is red over here, outperforms our modified ones only by a few percent points. So we're looking at throughput degradation that's actually measurable, but it's about two to five percent. So that's the concession that you're making here. Same thing goes for latency, so it's very similar graph. So it's not free, but notice that one of the things that we didn't do here was doing any sampling. And so that's something that's kind of work in progress right now. So the student who was working on this, my master students, was hired by one of the companies, that, uh, his name is Carl Walsberg, a guy who created VMware, hired him to kind of incorporate these types of uh, techniques into something that they're building with cloud physics. Uh, because this is a very efficient method and it doesn't do any sampling, so if you add sampling, it actually becomes very efficient. So here's some related work that um, has been done in this uh, area. I don't know how much time I have to talk about it, but there's a whole bunch of work. And there's kind of like a, a momentum now because this is, a, uh, this is important to uh, look at in a variety of different settings. In particular, there's a, a recent paper on SDI in, um, about what are called counter stacks and storage that, um, that do sampling that we're trying to uh, learn a little bit from, but they don't do any type of online estimates. They're trying to estimate the whole trace. It's a variety of different kind of related works, but we're kind of the first ones to really look at it in the context of, of these uh, network caches and try to parallelize the, the thing. Now, just to summarize kind of what we've been talking about so far, I presented you with several challenges, and I honed in on this one particular challenge of optimizing cache resources by doing this online profiling. And so we came up with this uh, MIMO framework that is efficient in the sense that it doesn't add a whole bunch of time per request. It's a small constant here, B, which is maybe 100. And the space you need per item now to store it is about log B. 
Um, and it has about 2 to 5% performance degradation in terms of throughput and in terms of latency. And that's the cost of uh, using our method. It's very accurate, it's surprisingly accurate, in fact. We're seeing 98 to 99.8% uh, accuracy on all the traces that we tried. Um, we'd love to have more traces. We're working with some companies to try to see caches in practice. Um, and so we were even able to prove that the error rate is order one over B, which is the number of packets again. And it's also a modular framework, so it's kind of something you could just plug into your memcast implementation of Redis or whatever it is that you're using for caching. Uh, and I argue, uh, maybe this is biased, that these are kind of simple algorithms. So I hope to be able to at least give you the idea behind each of them. So zooming out a little bit here at the end, so we've been talking about this kind of caching work that I do. So going back out and actually zooming back out to some of the other stuff that I'm doing, I figured I'd just give you a little bit of kind of a broad view of, of some of the other stuff I'm doing. In particular, I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff in, in security. And, and a particular question that drives me is, how do you teach people how to hack? First of all, why would you teach people how to hack? There's all sorts of ethical dilemmas to that. But one of the things that you can do is that if you want to teach kids about architecture or computer systems or anything, if you teach them, if you tell them you're going to teach them hacking, they will just go on their own. They'll read about Linux. They'll set it up. They'll do C program. They'll do all these things, and they'll be like frantic to learn more. I've never seen so much motivation because you teach them hacking, right? And then, of course. It's one of the kind of underrepresented uh, areas. It takes 20% longer to hire anybody uh, uh, from security. Like, it takes 20% longer to fill a role that requires security in IT. The, the whole industry is starving for people with expertise. Gartner just estimated that um, IT operating expenditures are going to be about 30% security related in 2020. It's going to be a huge field. So anyway, some, some of the things that I tried to do to try to teach people how to hack were to uh, start competitions. So I have like an annual competition where I just have people actually on states that are hacking each other. So I give them like a VM and they hack each other. And there's a scoreboard and there's like 500 people in the audience. There's a DJ. There's all this kind of fun stuff. It's actually really fun to watch. So it's kind of a, a, a new thing. Um, I created a company. So we have a, sin a company called Syndis, which has now eight employees where we um, effectively get contracts with big companies like Fortune 100 companies. and. They call us and they ask, like, hey, can you hack us? And we hack them, show them how we did it. We've always been able to break in. The shortest time it has taken was 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I give lectures. So I have like an annual course where I just teach this uh, hacking stuff. And I'm trying to bundle that and create like a MOOC out of it. Um, and uh, I was invited to give like a TEDx talk that's not been viewed by like more than half a million people um, about this particular endeavor of trying to teach people how to hack. And so. This is something that I think is a really fun hobby. So um, I have some other projects going in security that I can talk about to you separately, but this is kind of an overview of some of the things I do in that area. And then the kind of third hat that I have is kind of in data science or more applied things. In particular, I have a project that is funded by um, Iceland, which is the following. Can you detect epidemic outbreaks by looking at cell phone metadata? So if you think about that for a second, right? So you have metadata that's been collected by phone companies. We've talked a lot about this because of NSA and Snowden and all that stuff. This metadata has been collected for billing reasons. It contains information like, hey, this anonymous person A called anonymous person B from this tower at this time. From this, you can actually infer movement of individuals. And you can also in infer routines and thus deviations from people's routines. And if enough people in a population deviate from the routine, something may be going on. So this project is, is aimed to try to figure out if we can have this kind of behavioral sensor that says, hey, there's a lot of anomaly going on right now. So, like in real time, predict that there's an outbreak going on that needs to be investigated. This would be a huge contrast to how things are done currently. Because currently, like for instance, let's take H1N1 in 2009. What happened was that there's um, you need to call people, you send out surveys. It takes months before you can say, like, hey, there may be, <laughs> there may be an outbreak going on. Right? It's like long after it's uh, long after you actually need the information. So you need to estimate the severity of the disease, how many people get infected per case, all these different things, and it just takes a very long time. So real-time outbreak detection is something that's a, it's a big thing. And we're already seeing something. We have data from Iceland that we're given. It's actually coupled with health data, where we actually see this in the data. If we know that you're sick, there is a measurable difference in your behavior that we can detect. And we're, we have a lot of people now working on this particular project. We're doing some deep learning on the behavioral uh, parts and some other fun stuff to try to figure out how your behavior changes and if we can detect this in the general population. So it's kind of a, a fun project that I uh, can discuss with you further. Anyway, so 
that kind of wraps up my talk. So here's my summary slide of what we were talking about before, and I'm just happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Longest again. So some of these things are, so these engagements are set up uh, in kind of a funny format. Sometimes it's it's you're already given access to a network and you're trying to get like uh, the gold, right? You're trying to get change the source code or read the CEO's email or steal some credit card data or something like that. And that can take a long time. Sometimes the project is can you even get into our network? And that's always the simplest assignment because it's it, it is the simplest thing we want to get into the outer perimeter of any network. What tends to be the case is that all these companies have these massive, they spend like 99.7% of the resources on trying to have a massive firewall and uh, antivirus and stuff to try to get people away from this outer perimeter. And that's the simplest thing to cross. And so once you're inside, everything is like, oh, everything's unlocked. There are all these file servers. You just like walk around, pick up stuff. Nobody notices. There's nothing even monitoring that you're there. You just walk away and you're just like, okay, I have all these stuff. And they, they don't know what hit them. It's, it's like, okay, here's a real case. There's a financial company that services trillions of dollars per year. They call this, can you hack us? And they gave us three weeks to do it. We estimate it'll take three weeks. After 10 days, we called them, we have even hacked all your printers. There's nothing more we can hack in your organization. <laughs> and of course, there was like a silence on the line and they had to reorganize. But this is the reality. It's actually scarier than you might think. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to have as part of this company, we're trying to do a lot of education, like outreach. So we also have a platform where we're trying to teach people about fending off phishing attacks and things like that, just to try to create that awareness that is sorely missing in our society. Other questions? Yes. I, going back to, to the cash. Yes. Work, um, so one of the big differences that I don't know, maybe I missed you didn't bring up um, between sort of like the old, old view of caches and the new yes. one is that uniform size, right? Yes, like that's, that's another one. I just. I didn't want to have that so another bullet point. Different uh -huh. things of different sizes can have massively different effects. Can you talk a little bit about that? Pre precisely, right? So, so the observation is that um, when you have a, a traditional cache, you tend to have like something that's of a page size, like it's 4K or something. This is the traditional view of caching. We're saying like uh, if you're inside Facebook, an item can be seven bytes, it can be seven megabytes, it can be gigantic, right? And so if you evict something that's like seven mm -hmm. gigabytes. I don't know, it's exaggerating. Seven gigabytes, of course, that means that whoever uh, had that item evicted is not going to have to do seven gigabytes worth of computation or movement to so forth of data. So it can be massively disproportionate like that. The way caches currently deal with that is that they actually have this kind of exponentially increasing slabs, and they have run parallel caches with different slabs. So the, everything I've talked about in this, in this talk here can apply to different slab classes, and that's exactly how we implemented within Memcache. Um, that is another thing that is very interesting about how things have changed is, is it worthwhile, whenever I have a big cache, for me to evict two small things to make way for a bigger thing that's coming in, or should I not, right? This is a fundamental question, and nobody really knows the answer. There are, there's a lot of work happening in precisely that question. It's a great question. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were going to look at saying, I have picture 17, and I want to prefix yes. 18 out of um, are you going to apply that to say something shouldn't be cached? I mean, if you have all this information, perhaps you know yes. that it's going to be viewed exactly, exactly once. So, so what we're working on um, is effectively creating a little state machine of what is going to happen in your, what, what humans do with your distributed systems, effectively. So there's a higher level concept of you migrating to the next page or something on your, in your photo album. Um, so the idea is that once we know these transitions, we can actually dictate priorities over different cast items. So we can say, Here's everything I need to cache, and uh, I have kind of a good idea of when it's going to be used next. So I have a prior there. Right now, if you think about what LRU is trying to do, it's trying to say, like, okay, this thing was used um, this long ago. So likely it's going to, let's say it was used 30 seconds ago. So probably it's going to be used again 30 seconds from now. That's what LRU is trying to do. It's trying to say the past is exactly, exactly the future, right? What we can do is that we can create more sophisticated models of that and say, actually, we have information that whenever you access this type of stuff, here's the distribution of uh, when you're going to access it next. Give, based on that distribution, we can calculate metrics like uh, we have something called the survival curve to try to figure out well, how likely is it that a particular item is going to remain in the cache after a certain period of time. And then we can prioritize all the items based on that particular number. So we're working with a company called QuizApp. I don't know if you've watched NBC. They have like a, it's a company that. Um, uh, it's based in Iceland, and they gave us access to all the cache traces to address this question. It's, 
can we predict when things are going to be used next and then make sure that it doesn't enter the cache, doesn't stay there, or that things that need to stay in the cache stay there for longer without having to be explicitly refreshed. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. We'd love to talk to more about it. More questions? I think we have some time. Yes? Uh, what kind of workload would lead to particularly large errors? Workload with the particular errors. So it's something where you have um, where you have loops that are kind of a little bit like Pilates anomaly, where you tend to. Um, so here's here's pretty much what the algorithm is just trying to do. It has these variable size buckets, and it's trying to adjust the bucket sizes to hone in on these particular change points, right? So the bucket size is going to be like, okay, I need more resolution over here. So if your workload is such that it's trying to ha, 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 move away from this particular point and try to do work in that area and then it moves over like ha, ha I fooled you again. That's, that's the type of workload that's going to lead to very strange buckets, especially the last bucket is going to be very big. And that means that for us our theoretical bond no longer holds and it probably means that the actual uh, error upon its error itself is going to be high. So there was a workload there that actually had pretty bad, um, bad results here comparatively to the other ones. It's far away in time here, but let's see. What? We can search. Yeah. Here? Yeah, it was web search, right? Which is kind of a, uh, a bummer, right? Given that uh, this is the target uh, practice here. But web search here actually is a cast, a mid level cast that sees a very funky um, subset of requests in the system. In fact, it's sitting behind a bunch of other caches that have already kind of taken away a lot of the locality, what's being asked. So it's reasonably random. Um, and there are some other quirks in this particular workload that I think we should investigate in more detail, but we haven't really. So I think this is what we saw in practice and we kind of thought it was good enough. Where we moved from this is to just say, these are workloads that are kind of historical. And we want to get like the workloads of the particular target applications, which is why we're working with Quiza, why we're working with Facebook, why we're working with Akamai, to try to see what's actually happening and then work from there. And that's just, we're not there yet. Yes? Um, two very similar questions. Okay. One, on the assumption that all the caches are being similar events, can you instrument one cache out of thousands and then project your answers across the data center? And then the second question is, in a cache, could you just instrument a single thread and is that simple or is that... I mean, it's it's effectively the same question, right? right? I mean, it's just trying to see, just like if you see a subset of the requests that are uh, sampled in a particular manner, does that reflect on the overall workload? And what I said before in a kind of very fuzzy terms is yes, pretty much, but not quite, right? And understanding the discrepancy between the two is something that I'm actually a student working on right now, is to try to see to what extent can you take caches and create a hierarchy? And the hierarchy being that if you have a branch, it means that you have, for instance, consistent hashing going on or possible multiple threads or something like that. You're splitting the workload based on something related to the keys. And, uh, uh, and moving down the layer in this tree just means that you have kind of multi-layered caches, right? So for instance, um, if, you, if you look at Facebook, actually your browser caches a lot of your requests, like I mean, your own profile pictures in your local cache. And then the Akamai node sitting in your ISP is caching a lot of the other things that you and your friends that are at the same side are seeing. And then there's another CDN layer, and then there's an S layer at Facebook, and finally there's a back layer at Facebook. And each of them sees progressively less locality because they're kind of layered like that. So understanding exactly what happens to caches in these different layers is kind of poorly understood. I would say caches is actually one of the worst understood areas of computer system. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in it. Okay, yeah? this is the time for one more. One more. Okay, you're last. Great. Um, so taking this all the way back to your original motivation. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hit home. No, 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 you don't okay. have to change okay. to make a, there we go. <laughs> it, it was to make a decision. Do I add or subtract right. um, caching notes? Uh -huh. How accurate does it need to be? Is the difference between 95 and 95.3 percent, or is it the difference between 90 percent and 90? Yeah, exactly. So, so this is an excellent question. Answering that question means that we have to get people to actually use the system. This is why we presented it all over Silicon Valley. And um, uh, actually, some of the answers that we got were very interesting, which is that um, at this moment, we have so much money that we're just going to have enough servers, and this becomes relevant probably two years from now. That's one of the answers that we got. Um, we got a different answer from Twitter, which is that we have we can't do anything. We have no time. The <laughs> ship is sinking. Um, <laughs> so that was a dead end. Um, 
you, you really need to get operators to use it. So in that sense, um, what we're trying to do is to understand the workloads a little bit better so that we can actually give quantifiable information about what would happen. And right now, because we just have these toy workloads, we can't say that. It's more like, a, hi, I'm in my ivory tower. I've done all this work. Will you implement this? And they're like, we don't know how it's going to work. Right? So now I want to like, do some of the work with them. Hi, I'm in the ivory tower, and I kind of know how every system works. It will save you this much money. Look, money. And then they can go around and say, like, oh, okay, we'll consider it. So that's, that's where we're working from. Though. So you're right. The accuracy is probably not going to be that granular. Um, I think we're out of. I, I can. I can I'll stick around a little. Let's take a look. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Yeah.